made involuntary labor the key to white survival. So this is where Dr. Anderson goes pretty hard. He pretty much says that it was uh, an abundance of land. So they got all this land and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to farm it. They don't know how to, you know, how to clear it or anything. And that they don't have the labor to do it. So this required them to find uh, a labor class that could actually handle all this free land. So they said those who owned the largest tracts of undeveloped land could not convert the huge tracts into productive, profitable agricultural businesses without the assistance of a disciplined, strong, expendable, and preferably unpaid workforce. Without such a labor force, it was questionable whether the colonies could survive. So America's very survival is built on the backs of black people. That's what he's saying here. He's basically saying that the colonies from which America derived could not have survived had it not been for the black slaves. So uh, without such a labor force, it was questionable whether the colonies could survive, let alone prosper. Neither Indians nor white indentured servants could do, would do the laborious work. A bound labor force was, was the logical solution. The Maryland public edict on blacks took on greater importance as the colonial settlers realized that they possibly had the key to their common labor problem and the use of black people as their uncompensated workers. The labor problem was resolved in 1665 when all of the existing colonies enacted laws to enslave blacks. The, so, so, so at this point, Maryland had already passed an edict saying, you know, look, black people are not, they're not like us. They can't enjoy the fruits of white society. We're not gonna let them do it here in Maryland. And they had an issue where white people had been given away, had been given so much land from the government. Again, another uh, argument in favor of reparations, right? So they had so much land that they needed people to work the land. The white indenture servants said no. The Indians said hell to the naw. So they went and they expanded slavery to the other colonies. The other colonies, you know, the same way corporations all meet with each other to find best practices to make the most money. Well, they, I guess, had a meeting. And they said, hey, you know, in Maryland, we, we enslave our Negroes and they helped us get a lot done and we don't have to pay them or anything. So the other states said, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to take that back to Pennsylvania. I'm going to take that back to Delaware. I'm going to take that back to my state. Right. So uh, the Maryland colonies original edict was expanded into a public policy on blacks. Stipulating that, quote, black people shall constitute an available, now these are their words, black people shall constitute an available, uncompensated, uncompetitive, well-disciplined, permanently subordinated workforce, which shall be separated, separated from the white society. So this, these edicts, these particular sorts of rules, the, 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 these, you know, Negro rules, um, pretty much form the foundation of the country that you live in today. Right. I mean, this is this is America. This is what this is what they uh, designated you for, uh, you, know, you know, 300, 400 years ago. Um, they continue to do this for hundreds of years. And this is still true to this day. The primary purpose of forced black labor was to bring whites newly acquired land to productivity and value by clearing the forest, building the houses, raising the crops, tending the livestock, preparing the food and raising and comforting white white families. Second. The slaves were to supply England's industries with valuable cash crops and commodities. After the 1660s, all the colonies had written black enslavement into their statutes. England, as the mother country and the overseer of the colonies, was the first to codify the colony's public policy on black slavery into an act passed in 1667 called the Act to Regulate the Negroes on British Plantations. So in 1667, they passed an act called the Act to Regulate the Negroes on British Plantations. So the British saw themselves as the big bosses. The colonies were their little outposts. So it's almost like, uh, you know, the, the corporate headquarters for McDonald's. And then each colony is like a McDonald's restaurant. And they need employees in every McDonald's. And they form a company-wide policy to decide how they're going to manage their employees and manage their workers. So besides regulating the slave trading industry, this act introduced the concept of blacks as personal property and advocated strict and severe treatment of blacks. So they started teaching white people how to be really mean, how to really make sure your slaves know their place. A doctrine of black expendability was explicitly advocated in this act, which granted white society the right to brand, whip, or actually kill enslaved blacks. So in order to make sure that white people did not feel guilty for mistreating fellow human beings, they put it in the law to say that black people are not human beings. They are an expendable 
life form. They, they're just like pigs, cows, or chickens. So you can brand them like a cow. You can whip them like a horse. You can also kill them if necessary because these are not human beings like you. So don't feel bad. You can go kill two Negroes during the week and still go to church on Sunday. That was in, in this, and pay attention now. This is, this is, so what you're hearing here, what you're seeing here is you're seeing the, the um, a, a explicit, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'm, I'm want to find the right term to describe what I'm trying to express here. There's one word I'm looking for here. Um, I cannot find the right term. I'll find, you know, one day I'm going to find the word and I'm going to say it because I'm looking for the word and I cannot find it. But what they did was they put it on paper. That's my point, right? It's one thing. It's like if you start a business and you say to your friend, like, hey, we're going we're gonna to make chicken and we're going to sell chicken on the corners and we're going to sell it with some Kool-Aid and this and the other. It's one thing to talk about the plan. It's another thing when you document the plan. Right. When you legislate it, when you make it into like a code, like like this is the rule. Right. Like it's different from like 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 we know that the mother is 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 different from the father and that the parents have have power over the children. But it's another thing when I completely when I when I almost codify there you go. I think the word codification might be a good term to use. Right. Like I like we put it on paper. And a lot of times when you codify something, it validates it more than if you just say it, right? If you just all sort of subtly know that white people are better than black people, that's one thing. But when you put it in a fucking law, excuse my French, I'm sorry. Some of y'all got kids. Pretend like y'all didn't hear that. But when you put it in a law, then you're kind of just saying like, this is the way it is. Like, look at the way children are um, are, are raised. That, you, know, you ever think about that? You ever notice how like there are things that you were just taught when you were little, uh, laws and rules, and then somebody breaks the rule and you're like, whoa, you, you can't do that. Well, who said you can't do that, right? Maybe before people could do that, but now because it's been, you know, it's been sort of implied, it's, it's, it's drilled into, it's documented in that way. It's been legalized, codified, uh, all these things. That it has a level of legitimacy that goes beyond just sort of that just being uh, the way things are done, right? Um, it's like if I, it's like, um, it's like if, if I say, if, if, if you know, for example, let's say uh, you guys know, I know, um, I know finance really well, right? And, and, but, but the fact that I have a PhD in finance kind of says a little bit more than just, okay, Boyce knows a lot about money, right? Or what if, what if uh, the president came along and I said, and, and he said, you know, I want to give Boyce the medal as the, 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 the financial leader of this generation, right? That gives a, a different level of realness to the to whatever the hell it is that people think I am, right? That's why you create symbolism. You know, actually my wife, I mentioned to you guys, my wife is an expert on the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind, <coughs> understanding how the subconscious mind works is critical to overcoming um, that black inferiority complex that we have, right? So uh, she, I asked her, I said, what are the things that control the subconscious mind the most? She said, um, she said trauma, repetition, and symbolism. <clears throat> so when I put it on a piece of paper and I say this is the law that black people are inferior to white people, I and I go through some ceremony to sign the law, right? You know when they make these acts, they they name it and they they, they everybody signs it and all this other stuff. It becomes more real. So people, so then you get to the point where you ask people, well, well, why would you believe something like that? They'll say, well, because it's the law. You know that's what the law says, right? So ultimately, what they really did was they really. Um, um, they, 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 all, they, they, they really made it into almost a doctrine, right? To say that white people are better than black people and black people just don't matter. You can beat them, you can whip them, you can kill them. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person because the law has pretty much said that this is okay. This is good. This is the way you do business. Okay. So, uh, so this is where it all came from. Remember we started from nothing in 1619, uh, 20 slaves get off the boat. Uh, 20 black people get off the boat. They're not necessarily slaves. By the, 1667, it's now become law that you are uh, inferior, uh, that we can do things to you that we can't do to other human beings, right? So the next uh, thing here is four years later in 1671, another Maryland act strengthened the public policy by enacting the doctrine of non-interference. 
This doctrine notified religious organizations that religious conversions and baptisms of slaves before or after the importation of North America did not entitle the slaves to freedom as some slaves had hoped. So that means that if you come here, remember religion was a big deal back then. It still is, but it was a bigger deal back then. There was a belief that, look, if you get baptized and I get baptized, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we all get the Christian benefits. They said that is just not true. That's not true anymore, right? And it reminds me of uh, when a black person goes to a white university and they think that because they got the same degree as the white boy, they're going to get the same job opportunities as a white boy, the same raises and promotions as a white boy. And then when that doesn't happen, we're all shocked and surprised, right? And, and that, but it doesn't surprise me because this is this is the country you live in. So it says this doctrine notified religious organizations that religious conversions and baptisms of slaves before or after the importation to North America did not entitle the slaves to freedom as some slaves had hoped. The non-interference doctrine was later expanded under the concept of, quote, personal property rights, end quote, which soothed the fears of white slave owners who were concerned about losing their investment in any slaves who converted to Christianity. So they were like, okay, Christianity is this loophole that slaves are using to try to not be slaves anymore. Well, we're going to close that loophole. The colonies devoted the next 20 years to perfecting a public policy that defined with mathematical precision what individuals, races, or ethnic groups would be slaves and how they would be treated with mathematical precision. White supremacy was created in America with mathematical precision. And that's the beginning. Like, they just got started. Like, this is 1660, 1671. This doesn't include what they did in the, in the 18th century, the 19th century, and the 20th century. Right. This is literally the beginning. This is the foundation of white supremacy. This ain't the whole monster. This is about maybe 5% of white supremacy. But even that 5% was created with mathematical precision. So what does that mean? That means that if you are fighting white supremacy or trying to deconstruct it, trying to get away from it, trying to evade it, trying to understand it, trying to overcome it, and you're not operating with mathematical precision, then you're not going to win. You cannot defeat white supremacy unless you are alert enough and educated enough and thoughtful enough to challenge it with mathematical precision. It was built with mathematical precision. It's going to require mathematical precision for you to overcome it. Let me keep going. See, white folks, be, they, they, they think about stuff, I guess, when they before they decide they want to terrorize people. They really put a lot of planning into it, kind of like gentrification or something, right? So this, except this is like the gentrification from hell. By 1705, Virginia produced a codified a codification of laws applying to slaves called the Slave Codes, which standardized the public policy on blacks as well as whites white behavior toward blacks. So they didn't they didn't just give black people the rules they were supposed to follow. They created the rules that white people were supposed to follow when they engage with blacks. The codes imbued the public policy on blacks with a new kind of social arrangement of accountability within the white community. It, 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 it not only established rules of conduct with specific penalties for slaves, but it also implied a code of conduct for all white persons in their relations with blacks. It prohibited any white person from committing any act that elevated the status of blacks or demonstrated leniency in the treatment of slaves. So if you were white and you were you showed any love to black people on any level, you elevated a black person, you, you showed leniency toward your slaves, then they would beat your ass too. The slave codes were premised in the belief that humility and weakness in the treatment of slaves anywhere was a threat to slavery and white privileged lifestyle everywhere. So you cannot be weak. You cannot be weak. So I want you to understand that you're dealing with a society that has told itself for hundreds of years that when you deal with these Negroes, you must deal with them with an iron hand and an iron fist. You cannot be weak. I want you to think about that every time you have people running around here thinking that black men are supposed to be weak and feminine. You cannot stand up to another man who's been trained not to be weak when you are showing up wearing a wig and a dress. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. So let's keep going. The slave codes reinforced the public policy, giving it substance and a, a, a statutory authority. In the South, the policy gave rise to a unique racial code of etiquette that prescribed the status, role, and expected behavior for both whites and blacks. The new racial etiquette gave respectability to the policy. Laws were enacted that required newspapers, businesses, and social organizations to be ever mindful of the policy and to publicize the code of etiquette. So not only did they put it in place with mathematical precision, as we discussed earlier, they then went to all the newspapers to further legitimize 
these ideas, right? Now these ideas, that's how you take something that's not real and you make it real, right? You use your institute, you develop institutions that legitimize the ideas that you want society to uh, to embrace. So here's the thing. I know you're pissed. I know you're pissed. I'm reading this. I'm pissed off too. This is just making me mad. But also after you finish being pissed off about what you're reading, I need you to take a step back and, and learn from it too. Learn from it too. The same way they codified and legitimized certain ideas that benefited their community over other people. Well, you can codify and legitimize things yourself. You can structure codes of conduct and codes of behavior and rules to live by yourself, right? You can do that. We have something in the Black Business School that we codified called the Black Core of Three. The Black Core of Three, which is our B1 doctrine, basically says we believe Black people should be educating our own children, creating our own jobs, supporting Black-owned businesses. And you've heard me repeat this 100,000 times because this is the law. In this land, that's the law. Right. So ultimately, you have the same ability to do everything that was done against you. Right. There's nothing he did to you that you can't do back. There's nothing that he did to build his nation that you can't do to build your own. So at, so so instead of spending all your time complaining about how vicious and how evil and how mean they are, understand that you win nothing You when you're bragging about how vicious they are with you, how much they controlled you, how much they pimp slapped you, how much they beat you down. All you're doing is doing exactly what the slave codes told you to do, which is to assume your place as an inferior Negro. When you're sitting there, especially for you men, but the women too, everybody, when you're sitting there and all you do is complain all day about how bad white people are treating you and ain't nothing you can do about it, what you're basically doing is you're being a white supremacist. You're buying into, what was the doctrine, Dr. Anderson name? name the doc, what was the doctrine called? Where, uh, what the, oh, the doctrine of racial superiority. You are following the doctrine of racial superiority because what you're doing is you're saying that white people are here, we are here. They are level 10, we are level four, right? And the only way a four can compete with a 10 is if the 10 decides to chop six letters off of, six numbers off of, it, off of its level so that we can be evil or, or equal. That's how we can achieve equality. I don't, I don't believe that. I don't think that's going to work. That's not going to work. So, so stop it. Stop it. You know, call out what they did to you call out what they owe you but at that point fight for what you owe yourself you owe yourself the right to stand up and to fight for whatever you deserve and to build it the same way everybody else builds and, and at the end of the day complaining ain't gonna do nothing let's keep going we're studying we're not complaining we're not reading this book so we can sit around and whine and cry about what they did to us we're reading this book so we can dissect and understand with mathematical precision I am a mathematician, by the way. My master's is in mathematical statistics. I taught mathematics at the University of Kentucky, so I can appreciate the idea of forming a strategy with mathematical precision that will allow our people to win. Let's keep going. Page 158, Black Labor, White Wealth. You can get a copy at powernomics.com. That's Dr. Anderson's website. This man is brilliant. He is wonderful. God bless him. Um, I, it is an honor to get a chance to read through his book and break it down for you. Uh, we will continue the work of Dr. Anderson for 300 years after he and I are gone, after all of us are gone. Let's keep going. The slave codes reinforce the public policy given a substance and statu statutory authority. In the South, the policy gave rise to a unique racial code of etiquette that prescribed the status role and expected behavior of both blacks and whites. The primary purpose of the code of etiquette was to support the public policy on the use of blacks by requiring that all whites act superior to blacks at all times and that blacks give deference to whites and act inferior to them at all times. The secondary purpose of the code and public policy was to make it possible for whites to exercise effective control over blacks and to strengthen the sense of white unity. So the goal was to unify the whites and make sure that they have power over blacks. In 1787, the drafters of the U.S. Constitution incorporated the colonial public policy on blacks into the founding documents of the new nation, making it the slaveholder's friend by recognizing and legitimizing black enslavement. So 1787, the drafters of the Constitution incorporated the colonial public policy on blacks into the founding documents of the nation. So what this is saying here in this paragraph is that the Constitution... When, when people go to court and they say, oh, the Constitution guarantees us certain rights. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. According to Dr. Anderson, in 1787, when they wrote the Constitution, they incorporated the, 
all these slave codes and, and all this stuff about black inferiority, they put that right into the Constitution. So the Constitution is a poisoned document. The Constitution declared blacks to be three-fifths of a person prohibited and, and prohibited Congress from outlawing the slave trade for 20 years and bound the states to assist in the returning of fugitive slaves to their masters. The drafters made it clear that the government was the legal instrument of white society and that it should be powerless to interfere with black enslavement within the states or with foreign slave trading practices. Yet on the other hand, it was also mandated to exercise its full powers to protect the white slaveholders' investments in slave properties. Until the Revolutionary War, the public policy on the use of black labor evolved primarily from the tobacco growing regions supported by commercial interests. The profitability of slavery declined until Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin in 1793. In the midst of Europe's industrial revolution, the cotton gin increased the popularity of cotton and black slavery. At the time, wool was the primary fabric because cotton was scarce and generally expensive. The cotton gin made American uh, excuse, made American produced cotton the king of agricultural products and the primary fabric of the world. This surge in cotton's popularity reshackled blacks to America's plantations. Businesses and industries associated with and independent, uh, depend, excuse me, dependent upon black slavery sprang up throughout the North and South. The renewed economic dependence on black labor demanded support from the public and private sectors. White society became more dependent than ever on black labor for creating wealth and income. Moreover, it became more determined to keep black subordinated, unskilled, non-competitive and excluded from white society. That's page 160, Black Labor, White Wealth, Dr. Claude Anderson, Powernomics.com. So here's what I want you to notice from this paragraph I just read. Stop letting people make you think slavery is a moral issue. It, it's not a, I mean, it, it, it was a moral issue only by circumstance. Slavery was driven by the economics. In fact, they would, slavery would have ended a hundred years earlier if it hadn't been for the, the, the invention of the cotton gin. See, and that, that's, that's the, the interesting triangulation between capitalism and slavery is that capitalism doesn't necessarily need you to be a slave, but capitalism understands that slavery is the most profitable business model that there is. Right. So so it's like a mafia boss. Mafia bosses don't want to kill you. They just don't mind killing you if they have to do that in order to make money. But if it's unprofitable to kill you, then they'll let you live. So effectively, what Dr. Anderson is pointing to, which all of us need to understand, and this is something that needs to be taught in our black public school system, right? We are the public school system. We are the front lines of the education of our children. So in our public school system that we own, that we control, we need to make it 100% clear that people understand that slavery ain't about just white people liking black people. I don't need a white man to like me. I don't need that. My mama likes me. My woman likes me. My kids think uh, they like me half the time. And uh, and, 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 and some, some of y'all even like me. Why the hell do I need my white neighbor to like me at all? What, what, he don't need me to like him. I don't need him to like me. This whole issue of race, reparations, slavery, all of this is not about whether or not people like you. It is about getting what is owed to you, what is due. Go watch Denzel Washington in A Raisin in the Sun. Did you, anybody seen that scene? And by the way, I had a chance to see Denzel. Um, in a raisin in the sun. I was in the third row on Broadway. And let me tell you, if I didn't even know who Denzel was, just from that performance, it was fences. I said fence, I said a raisin. I meant to say fences. I'm sorry. August Wilson's fences. I was in the third row. And if I even if I didn't know who he was, this man carried the whole show. It was amazing to see him act that close. He, he's that powerful. And so there was a scene in Fences where his son, anybody remember that scene? His son's like, Daddy, do you like me? And he said, what? He said, Daddy, Daddy, do, do you like do you like me? And he said, boy, it don't matter if I like you. It don't matter. If it, why are you worried about what people, whether people like you? You don't need nobody to like you. What you want is for people to do right by you. So stop walking around here letting people convince you that what matters in life is whether or not white people like you. Maybe some of them do. That does not help you feed your children. 
Somebody liking you is not going to get you what you deserve. Somebody liking you is only filling the void in your self-esteem that was created because you were born into a society that was built on the doctrines of racial superiority, non-interference, and expendability. So because you were raised to believe that you're inferior and expendable, you need people to like you so that you can feel whole, so you can feel important, right? But you were important before they ever even noticed you on the map. So let's get past all of that so you can move forward and actually get what is owed to you. You can't compete if you're worried about whether or not the competitor likes you. It doesn't work that way. Let me keep going. The Civil War. Okay, so I'm on page 160 of Black Labor, White Wealth, uh, Poweronomics.com. It's Dr. Anderson's book. He says, the Civil War modified the public policy, the public policy on blacks. By the mid-1800s, the North insisted on change in the public policy in black labor because Northern workers could not compete with the uncompensated slave labor of the South. So this is where your liberal allies came from. And I want to re- I want you to pay attention to this sentence. The, the, the North insisted on changing the public policy. They didn't insist on changing the policy because they said, oh, God, black people are so wonderful and black lives matter and we need to treat black people better. No, they insisted on changing the public policy because they said we can't compete with free labor. We can't compete with the fact that you got black people in your pocket and we wish we had Negroes working for us. That's why they wanted to change the public policy, not because they liked you. The South refused and the nation went to war. The national public policy was in limbo from immediately after the Civil War until the late 1890s. During this time period, the South had no official labor force or public policy on the use of blacks. Emancipation legally said blacks were no longer personal property. Newly freed slaves, pay attention now, this is good. This is where he's talking about when they when they uh, fired you from the plantation. They didn't really free you, they just fired you. But my friend Julian Gord talks about that. The slaves were not free, the slaves were fired. Newly freed slaves sought to break free of the old public policy. They demanded the 40 acres and a, and a mule that they had been promised as compensation for their years of unpaid labor. Blacks wanted to leave slavery prepared to be self-sufficient and productive. So your ancestors wanted for you exactly what you want for yourself. They weren't lazy, they, but something happened. What happened? I wanna know what happened. What? I know they were working hard. I know that they had dreams. What happened? Why couldn't my great great grandparents leave me anything? You should be asking yourself that question. However, to break free of the old national public policy would require the government to give millions of blacks unused public lands or portions of old southern plantations for homesteading. For the newly freed slaves to be competitive, they needed quality school systems to help them shake off centuries of forced ignorance and to protect them from the animosities of their old slave enslavers and enemies. The newly free slaves needed legal and police protection since they were never permitted to bear arms. However, blacks received none of these things because the national public policy on blacks as a labor force was unchanged by the Civil War. By the, both the North and the South had needs for a low paid, intellectually non competitive labor force. So both the North and the South were two pimps fighting over the same hoe. That's what it was. One, one pimp says, I'm not paying this hoe nothing, and, 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 I, and I might kill her. The other pimp says, I'm going to pay the hoe $2 a day, uh, but, I, but I know she's still a hoe. She's not my equal. I kid you, I'm sorry. I had to make it, I, I had to keep it real with you. That's what it is. The North and the South both said, we see the power of black people working for free, and all these trillions in wealth that we can extract from black people, we're just going to fight over that. The same way the Democrats and Republicans fight over you because you're the hoes that the two pimps are fighting over. That's that's what it is. So, so let's keep going. In reconciling post-war differences, the North adopted the public policy of its Southern b- brothers on the treatment of blacks. There was never any serious effort to give blacks any measures of economic independence or to compensate them for their generations of unpaid labor. So your white liberal friends, your allies, made no efforts to interfere and make sure you got what you deserve. As a Washington, D.C. newspaper quoted in 1968, quote, it is impossible 
to separate the question of color from the question of labor. For the reason that the majority of the laborers throughout the southern states are colored people and nearly all of the colored people are at present laborers. You still see signs of this when you go through airports and you see the black men that are shining the shoes and, and working as the, the, the porters and the TSA agents and everything else. Or you go to a hotel and you see black people having the laboring the laborer jobs and white people owning the hotel. Right. This all started back then. So let's keep going. To change black status as laborers would cause changes in society's political and social ordering of acceptability. Thus, the North and the South collectively agreed to continue, but modify the basic tenets undergirding the public policy on blacks. The black freedmen were penniless, uneducated, homeless, and friendless in a hostile South. So you got your freedom, but you didn't get nothing else. They were penniless, uneducated, homeless, and, and friendless in a hostile South. Without land, reparation, or tools, they had little choice except to offer the market their only resource, themselves. So this is something that I want you to write down right now in your brain or on a piece of paper. If you do not use the opportunity that you have to ensure that you invest something for your children, then your children will be in a position where they will be forced to sell themselves to the market in order to get money. Some of them are going to get up and go to work every day for a white man that hates their guts. Your daughter might end up on OnlyFans, right? Your daughter might end up on OnlyFans because that's where, they, I guess that's where they're getting money now. So, so, it, it, so the idea here is this, because the slaves who, uh, who were freed from the plantation, had no assets, they had no resources, they had no skills, they had nothing that, or, 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 or none of the skills that could actually get them where they wanted to get to, they had to show back up and sell themselves to capitalism, right? So, 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 so this, this, this model still applies to this day. This is why every day, several times a day, we're talking about asset accumulation as a measure of black success. Black wealth must become black culture. The same way they codified and indoctrinated and legalized and, and documented a new code of conduct for whites and blacks that was based on the subordination of blacks, we must document and codify a code of behavior amongst ourselves that is built upon the insistent, almost maniacal accumulation of wealth, resources, and assets so that our children are protected from the predatory nature of a racist capitalist society in a country that spent 400 years hating your black ass, like hating you. Like they were trained, they trained themselves to hate you. Even the pastors hated you, right? They started changing the words in the Bible. No, take that out. They, black people ain't nothing, right? They had to make sure that they covered their tracks completely, right? It's almost like that that movie with Kevin Hart and uh, and Wesley Snipes where they killed they killed Ari. In my if you haven't seen True Story, you should watch it on Netflix. Shout out to Wesley and Kevin, great job, right? So they they killed the, this guy and they had to cover their tracks, which meant they had to they had to erase everything, delete messages on the phone. They had to go kill somebody else who who knew what was going on. They had to do all this to cover their tracks. So so because they're trying to create a false narrative right or now the same way they're trying to get everybody to get the jab right we want to make sure we cover our tracks we don't want any dissenting opinions out here we're going to censor people on youtube we're going to have people killed we're going to make sure doctors get delegitimized we're going to make sure that we cover our tracks so we can maintain control of the narrative that's what they did during slavery they covered their tracks so they could control the narrative and the narrative that they eventually gained control of was this idea that whites are superior to blacks and that black people are expendable and worthless. So you're fighting against that. So in order for you to counter that level of mathematical precision in the, in the foundational creation of white supremacy, you must have an equal amount of, of diligence and mathematical precision and discipline in the development of a black excellence agenda that is going to make sure that your children can kick the asses of everyone else's children, that your children can compete on such a level that is so high and so amazing that, that everyone else gets intimidated before the game even begins. But you have to be ready. You have to plan ahead. You have to prepare. Wars are won by those who prepare. When I talk to my daughter and I ask her, I say, what are the three Ps for success? She says, uh, practice, 
uh, preparation and perseverance. That's what she says to me. That's literally the number one message I'm giving my daughter right now. So let's keep going. Let me keep reading. By the way, we're reading Black Labor, White Wealth by Dr. Claude Anderson. Those of you that can see me on video now, I was doing audio before, but I hit the video. So that's why I just popped up on the screen. Um, also, uh, just a reminder, don't forget the Black Wealth calendar. If you want a calendar, you can go to BoyceWatkins.com. So feel free to go to BoyceWatkins.com and the calendars are there. So uh, feel free to get, get those if you want to put that on your refrigerator. So that's available for those of you that want one. All right. So let me keep reading. The black, so, so the black freedmen were penniless, uneducated, homeless, and friendless in a hostile South. Without land reparation, without land reparations or tools, they had little choice except to offer the market their only resource, which was themselves. As an available, trained, cheap labor force, blacks stepped into a predictable future. The Southern states enacted the black codes. So first they had the slave codes, then they had the black codes, which pretty much were the slave codes for black people who weren't slaves anymore, which revised the national public policy on blacks forcing them into sharecropping on Southern farms under the control of former slaveholders. The black codes effectively modified the public policy by substituting sharecropping for slavery. And then the substitute for sharecropping became things like student loans. Student loans are nothing more than another type of sharecropping. It's where you put the sharecropper in so much debt that they have to work for you for life just to confront the debt. They will never repay the debt because once they repay the debt, they're free to go, right? So you don't want them to repay the debt. You just want them in debt for life. That's where debt becomes slavery. So this is where the student loan issue, which many of you are probably dealing with this right now, that's where you have to really sort of be mindful. Again, this system was built with mathematical precision. You have to have equal amount of precision to fight it. The black codes effectively modify the public policy by substituting sharecropping for slavery. The public policy during the civil rights era so now we're moving to the 1960s and, and we shall overcome and all that stuff. The latest great change in the national public policy came in the early 1960s and coincided with the civil rights movement, which championed the awakening of black America during what became known as the decade of progress between 1955 and 1965. Blacks won the battle to attend white schools, sit at white lunchroom counters and sit in bus seats that has historically been reserved for whites only. Little notice was given amidst the celebrating to the fact that the income gap between blacks and whites was widening. So they got you focused on everything else except the money. This is great. Um, the two societies, sorry, so little notice was given uh, to the fact that while the, during the celebrating, the income gap between blacks and whites was widening. The two societies were growing more segregated than ever. Blacks were losing their few businesses and disposable incomes to white suburban stores and black unemployment was beginning to skyrocket. The, in the integration accomplishments of blacks had coincided with the new phase of the, of the public policy on blacks, obsolescence. For the first time in the history of the nation, blacks were free from white society's prescribed labor role. Major advances in technology became the magic bullet that freed the larger white society from dependence on black labor. The two groups' newfound freedoms caused major adjustments on black-white relations. White society's shift away from its dependence on black labor was noted by Alvin Toffler in his book, Power Shift. Toffler asserted, quote, the most important economic development of this lifetime was the use of a new system of creating wealth based no longer on muscles, but on minds. So this is interesting, right? Because um, some would say that this coincides with uh, so that this 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 idea that maybe in the 1950s or 60s during this decade of progress, they don't you don't need black people anymore as laborers, right? Um, maybe you, uh, you because number one you got technology, right? But then two, you've got massive amounts of immigration, right? So you're bringing people across the border who can take the jobs that black people uh, used to have. Uh, if you go all throughout parts of Chicago and Philadelphia and New York and Houston, you're going to find jobs held by people from other countries that used to be held by black people. Right. So, so the question is, what do you do with the black people? What do you do with them? Right. So let me keep reading. We'll answer that question later. Whites began moving toward a colorblind society where new labor saving machines replaced the need for black muscles and sweat. Mach machines were less offensive and threatening. 
it was unlikely that new labor-saving machines would champion equality, integration, or civil rights. Instead, new technology provided a bridge from the old world to the new world and freed the dominant white society from its old ways of thinking about race relations, its old ideologies, and its public policies. New world technology pushed white society into the new public policy for blacks. Few unskilled jobs were left in white businesses and industries. Simultaneously, conservative and liberal white politicians alike claim that since the civil rights movement has succeeded in giving blacks their social and legal rights, there was nothing else anybody could do for blacks. Blacks were therefore finally free, but obsolete. So basically it was, what he's saying is that because they gave you Dr. King and we shall overcome, they don't owe you nothing, right? That's, that's pretty much the argument he's making here. So eight factors appear to have driven the public policy on the use and treatment of blacks across the centuries. One, the European colonies were predisposed by their native culture to have negative feelings about blackness and black people. So they came here, they didn't like your black blood anyway. Two, they established a public edict that was based around a common need that if resolved would be beneficial to all members of white society. So it's like, hey, we don't like black people and we need labor. So why not make the black guy into our laborer? So and let, let's formalize it. Let's put it on paper so people will think it's more legitimate, right? Three, white society refined and vigorously supported a coherent public policy on blacks that was transmitted from generation to generation through laws and social customs. So once you put the uh, once you put the black inferiority thing and the white superiority thing, once you um, codify white supremacy then you make sure that you pass it down to the children. You put it in the school system. And then you make sure the black kids are going to schools that are controlled by whites so that they too will be as committed to white supremacy as white people are. That's why I believe that you should seriously consider whether or not you want your kids to be educated by people who don't look like them. It's messing their brain up. Number four, the policy was codified by government official government acts. So the government gets involved. Five, it was concertedly supported by all levels of government, schools, churches, businesses, and the larger general society. Six, a sense of community accountability for supporting the public policy was established. So again, just like almost like with the jab, right? Once you make things into, once you decide who you hate, you then decide how can we benefit uh, collectively from exploiting the people that we hate, and then let's put it into law to allow us to further legitimize the exploitation, and then let's make sure that this idea uh, permeates throughout all institutions, and then let's now put pressure on each other to make sure we stay on code. This is not just a reflection on the, of the sinister efforts that were committed by racist whites to control you. This is also a reflection of how you, as the head of your damn household, can also implement a codification of rules and value systems that allow your family to win. Do you understand? The strongest families I have seen are the families that have a code. You must have a code in order to be successful. Even individually, a code of conduct is a, is, is a requirement for anybody to be successful. Michael Jordan even wrote in his book that I read when I was 23 years old, he, he, might, he might be a bastard, but you can't say he can't play basketball. And he said that the difference between regular people and great people is that great people have excellence as part of their code of conduct. That excellence is just, just, uh, just your value system. That is your culture. That is the thing you strive for in everything that you do. And if you look in Michael Jordan's life, He's just one example, right? But, I, but I'd love for your whole family to apply this, right? You will see that this man makes more money now than he did when he was playing basketball. Why? Well, because he applies his standard to everything that he does, right? So, so having a code of conduct is critical for any individual or any group that wants to be successful, whether you're talking about a great football team or you're talking about a great family. The rules are always the same. Number six. Oh, sorry. Number seven, the public policy receives total commitment from all segments of the community. Eight, the public policy was continuously promoted 
and coordinated by institutions and other entities. So once you agree on what the code is and you write it all out, you, you, you create the doctrine, then you pressure each other into staying on code, you get off code, we're gonna kick your ass, right? And then after that, you constantly promote the code. You constantly remind yourself every day, every day, every day, right? So if your family's on code, you reiterate that code every day. Maybe have a simple set of basic rules that you remind your kids of every single day when you talk to them. Like for example, every day, you know what I do with my kids? I totally piss them off. Every time they're late or they're, they're dragging along or something goes wrong, I'll say, preparation is the key to success. Preparation is the key to success. Preparation is the key to success. And I say that over and over because I want that in their subconscious. That's our code. We prepare. We're not going to get caught slipping and sleeping. We're going to be ready. Okay, so let's keep going. <clears throat> As a result of these factors, a consensus was reached on how blacks were to be treated. The public policy was expanded and modified incrementally. The adjustment continued over the centuries based upon the broad labor needs of white society. The nature of the modifications can be tracked to some extent by the historical developments of the nation. When new opportunities and challenges demanded human labor in the agricultural fields of the South, the rangelands of the West, the factories of the North, or the military battlefronts all around the globe, the appropriate government or white institution made sure that the black labor force was available and in the forefront. So what I will say is this, and this is where I'm going to um, close us down for tonight. Because I start talking too long, my head starts hurting. I'm going to go finish watching that Kevin, Kevin uh, Hart movie. Black people are truly extraordinary. Um, you have gone through a lot, and because you've gone through a lot and you survived a lot, you have a lot. You are a lot. You are extraordinary people. <clears throat> you are disciplined uh, when you want something. You can work your ass off. You know how to work yourself into the ground if you have to. You have so many talents and skills and attributes that other people identify within you, that make other people, that made other people want to make you into slaves. So they said, if, if, if we can get these people working on our team, they can help us win. It's like a like a football team with a great offensive line. You you were an excellent offensive line for white people, right? You cleared the path. And the, their running backs ran right through to the end zone every time. You cleared the path for all this wealth that exists in America. So one of the things that I want to do in my lifetime, this is one of my personal goals. This is one of my dreams is I don't know if I can do this, but I can't do this by myself. I need your help. We all have to do this together. Is I want to take that mighty ship of called Black Excellence and Power and Black hard work and perseverance and all the things that make you special, and I want us to turn the direction of the ship. I want us to stop applying all this power, all this economic power, all this, uh, all this intellectual power, all this hard work to building things for white people and just shift it to where we're building things for black people. I would trade that for a reparations check any day of the week. Because if you do that, if you can do that, at least with your family, and we, or if we were somehow able to do this as a community, what we simply say to other communities, look, we like you, we, you know, it, it, we don't have any issue with you, but we're going to start working for ourselves harder than we work for you, then you would literally see an instant growth in black wealth in the trillions every generation. Like, like we would literally take ourselves to the moon off of that. That's what B1 is all about. The B1 philosophy simply says, everything that's special about you, turn it to your community. Everything that's great about you, put it into your family. Put it into yourself, right? Everything, everything God blessed you with, bring it back home. Don't take it across town. Don't take it overseas. Bring it back home. If you do that, that is your key to winning. That is how you will win this fight, okay? All right, so... We are done for tonight. We are on page 163 of Black Labor, White Wealth by Dr. Claude Anderson. You can get copies of this great man's book at Poweronomics.com. I hope you'll consider getting copies of, of Dr. Anderson's books for your family for Christmas uh, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a great gift to give away. Uh, also, uh, again, if you want to uh, take a look at the Black Wealth calendar for 2022, just go to BoyceWalkins.com. Or if you follow me on Instagram, the Instagram's the real Boyce Watkins. You can just hit the link in the bio and the calendar's right there. So feel free to order a calendar uh, if, you, if that's something that would help you in your wealth journey for this year. All right, guys, <clears throat> I'm going to go. You can hear my voice uh, disappearing. And I'll admit, when I started here, I was actually kind of tired. But uh, talking to you really energizes me. It is literally like like pumping adrenaline into my body. And so um, all the, you know, everything that I felt is, is very, very real because I feel like this is our chance. This is our chance. This is our time. This is our opportunity. 
that we're going to do some things right now that our children are going to be talking about 100 years from now. Our grandkids, great grandkids are going to be talking about the year 2021. So let's leave them something they'll never forget. That requires all of us to get out here and just do our best. You ain't got to be perfect. Just make sure you do your best. Got it? We on the same page. Give me a yes in the chat if you agree. If you're ready. If you're ready, type the word ready. How about that? I'm ready. Like everybody say ready. All right. So God bless you. I'm out of here. Love you. I will see you all soon. And uh, have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.